Hello. Um, yeah, this is Martin. Uh, Martin is a future integration representative. Actually, he's a recovering consultant. That means he now tries to actually make things work instead of explaining them and then walking away. <laughs> and uh, yeah. All right, so uh, welcome everybody to this presentation. Uh, the, the lovely voice you've just heard belongs to Christian Kuntop, who uh, is probably now to most of you still uh, from his role as a uh, database consultant developer, whatever, at Booking.com, um, where he was active for some years now. And we're working for a company called Sys11, and um, that's uh, a hoster that does, does uh, mostly e-commerce hosting. Um, what we're doing actually is trying to build the, the uh, um, addition or replacement of the current hosting platform, and um, that is supposed to be running on OpenStack. Um, we have been trying that for a year, and our experience, uh, well, we are trying to explain them here. And uh, one thing we need to explain is, I just realized earlier this morning, this conference now has a code of conduct, which it has for the first time, at least I remember. And um, this code of conduct states that we are supposed to not use intimidation or harassment during the presentation or during the whole conference, which obviously <coughs> is going to be a bit hard in a presentation that's titled 45 Minutes of OpenStack Hate. Um, so we decided to add this parental advisory to the presentation. Uh, should we be using words that your mother wouldn't want you to use? Just don't use them and uh, we apologize in advance for that. So every good presentation needs to start with involving the audience. Who of you guys has heard of OpenStack? Who of you guys is using OpenStack? <laughs> in, so in production? Who? In production? No. <laughs> okay. Which, okay, which? That, that makes my next question moot because it was, would be, uh, does it hurt? <laughs> the interesting thing about OpenStack, and I guess you're mostly here um, because uh, you have read about the subject all the time on newspapers and whatnot, is that OpenStack is quite a high project at the moment. So. There hardly is any project in the free and open source community that would have as much momentum in its public reports and, and, and the public um, as OpenStack does have at the moment. And whenever you see somebody talking about cloud computing, you will realize that most large vendors by now support OpenStack officially, or at least support it by adding development um, capabilities and by spending money to make OpenStack work as a project better than it is working at this point in time. And this obviously um, raises some interesting questions because many companies willing to introduce a cloud computing setup are facing a number of questions and vendors supporting and selling OpenStack solutions will have answers for you. So whenever you look into solutions that are pre-bundled such as Red Hat OpenStack distributions and whatnot, um, you will see the same arguments popping up all the time. We have a number of reports about OpenStack, such as the ones taken here. The German version of this presentation has one that is even funnier, talking about monkeys and OpenStack and whatnot. In fact, OpenStack is in the media all the time. And whenever you do something with OpenStack, vendors will promise you lots of things. Vendors will promise you to deliver something that is very similar to what you can see here, including the weather, although this should make you suspicious already, because as you can see, there are no clouds in this picture. And every OpenStack administrator has a quite, or every person that expects to become an OpenStack operator has a very clear understanding of what this job is going to be. So they will be seeing themselves in front of a large control room, pulling all the things and, and, and pressing buttons and whatnot. And the reality, sadly, is a bit different from what most administrators expect to get, to get when they use OpenStack. <laughs> so um, at least this is the experience we have made. When you take one of the OpenStack pre-packed products out of the box, then this is what you will be doing all the time in your role as system administrator. <coughs> and this brings up quite an interesting question. What is it that we want to do? So what is, what is the product supposed to do? From the, the point of view of the underlay of the actual physical hardware, what we want to do is we want to be able to run any VM anywhere. And that means we need to um, be able to build networking that uh, takes any number of VMs on any physical hosts and put them together in a virtual network that is isolated. And we need to be able to bring the persistent state that is in some volumes anywhere in the network to wherever the VM is running at the current point of time. So we have two problems that we need to solve from the point of view of the underlay 
that are actually pretty hard, and that is uh, software-defined storage and software-defined networking. Um, from the point of view of the overlay, what we want to do is we want to write a script that describes our network and the switches and the machinery and uh, build this as virtual hardware uh, and then execute it and that would then magically materialize that hardware with uh, total disregard for any physical constraints. Uh, it will just appear uh, by running the script. So we have infrastructure as code. Why do we want to do that? Because we, for pretty little money, we get actually pretty good hardware. And unless you're running a database at booking, you don't have uh, um, requirements that are that big. Less money doesn't buy, uh, half the money wouldn't buy you a box half the site size, but something much smaller. So what you need to do is you need to buy a big box and cut it up into small parts that are the right size, and then sell the parts. Um, any VM anywhere means that you have here the uh, physical network, a bunch of hosts that are networked together in a kind of full mesh. Then you have a bunch of VMs on each host, and um, this, this and this host, they form together a network. There's some kind of storage somewhere attached to that, and you need the connection to the outside world. So you have um, these components that you need to manage. Some of these problems are hard. The first hard problem is storage. Um, so <coughs> actually what looks like an easy problem would be running a VM with ephemeral storage. You start a VM, it has uh, an empty local disk, and uh, when you terminate the VM, the local disk is also gone. But from the point of the view of the underlay, um, that is a bit more complicated because um, if you actually need to do something to the physical host, you would terminate all the VMs and at some point in time the customer probably gets annoyed. So what you would want is uh, um, have shared storage so that you can migrate VMs across the network without too much interruption so that you can do maintenance to a physical host without actually shutting down the VMs um, that have been previously running on that host so that you can evacuate that. Uh, so the first lesson when you are planning an open stat network is that there is no such thing as local storage unless the customer specifically asks for a volume on local storage that is probably a Fusion I.O. or something. But even then you should probably talk. You owe me a drink. I drink whiskey. Thank you. Um, uh, even then when the customer requires, say, a local Fusion I.O., you should probably talk to them because uh, they are either building a failure point into their thing uh, or they still deal with network latency because they still need to ship the data from the local storage to somewhere else. Uh, local storage is never a good idea and not a legal default. Then you have um, VMs with volumes. Volumes is persistent storage that lives longer uh, than your VM. Uh, and that means that the writes are probably remote and they are probably re redundant. Um, so the relevant metrics you have to deal with is bandwidth and megabytes per second. Um, I, op uh, I operations per second, uh, multi-threaded, and um, the hardest seems to be latency, that is I.O. Op uh, operations per second single-threaded, and you can do the second I.O. only if the first uh, F-Sync or F-Data-Sync has returned. Um, they all, these limits all come from the network and the, the underlying uh, properties of the network. The, uh, Megabytes per second, for example, you are doing writes over the network, and if you have a 10 gig link and you need to do all writes twice, um, then uh, you are looking at about 600 megabytes per second that you can get, tops, no matter how fast your storage is or how uh, rated uh, and, and um, interleaved your storage is. Um, and if you're looking at uh, sequential f strings per second, you're looking at an IP based network over a 10 gig link then you're looking at about 10,000, maybe 15,000 F-Syncs per second that you can do. Uh, and if you need more, then you're looking into something that is not running IP, that is InfiniBand uh, based, and um, that is from the data center operations point of view a big pain. So you're going to avoid this uh, as long as you can, and you're going to do this only if you absolutely have to. Um, some things scale easily up to the physical limits. Some are harder to scale. Um, and the typical, from an e-commerce hoster's point of view, thing is a MySQL slave that is running on, uh, on such uh, uh, volume. <coughs> because that is running single-threaded, you're looking basically at this number. Uh, and that means that the 
first test that you need to do with any storage is testing that. So you're basically having a very, very simple test. You're generating a 100 gig file. You're starting uh, FIO or another uh, I.O. tester and you're running a 16K random write benchmark um, and you're looking at the I.O.s per second that you get. Uh, when that comes out with adequate numbers, then you can look at all the other things. If that doesn't come out with uh, adequate numbers, then you are looking at the wrong kind of storage and you need something else. <coughs> the default that OpenStack delivers is uh, basically the problem is left as an exercise to the reader uh, because, uh, or the buyer in, these, in, in this case, because um, what they deliver is not very useful. But they have this, and uh, storage vendors are totally in love with that approach because um, the, the suggestion is that you go buy a filer, and if you're running this not at a hoster scale, but at a, say, department to compute server level, then buying a filer is probably also an adequate solution. But if you're doing this at enterprise scale or as a hoster, that doesn't work. You need some kind of distributed storage. The default solution for that is Ceph, and Ceph is actually quite good. Uh, on the bandwidth de uh, uh, department, it's, it's uh, basically able to saturate the network. Um, it has very good multi-threaded IO per S, 1200 or more, uh, easily done, and if you, if you scale this up with more disk, this actually goes up. And it's quite robust. Um, we have been testing a Ceph installation, abusing this quite a bit. You can take one of these OSD storage controller demons uh, and uh, ZIG stop them so that they can't get replaced. Uh, then wait for the cluster to degrade, then ZIG cont the daemon so that it wakes up and it recovers from that. You can go into a subdirectory, delete some data, and in the next deep scrub it will discover that and repair that. So that, that is impressive uh, engineering. Um, it is using a hash algorithm that is based on the topology underneath. So if the topology of the cluster changes because something falls over, it's actually replicating more and distributing more data than strictly is necessary to recover from the failure. Uh, and because of that, you need a second background network only for Ceph and for its replication uh, so that it doesn't affect the front network uh, that you're using. And it's not very good at sequential IOPS. When we do the MySQL benchmark with this, we are seeing 200 I.O. operations per second. If you're trying to boot the 18 gigabyte default Windows 8.1 volume on a Ceph volume, it takes about 15 minutes to boot the Windows. And that is not really acceptable. So we need proprietary components in our OpenStack cluster in order to make it work. Uh, that's no longer a pure play solution and that is not really possible. Uh, you either have a, f have a filer or some kind of proprietary storage that is better at this sequential I.O. thing than Ceph. And that means that OpenStack is not really an open source project in the sense that you can build something that actually works in production from open source components. Um, if you accept that and then go from there and look at the hardware you want to buy, you're looking at distributed storage and you're looking at the I.O. requirements that you actually have. And in order to make it um, uh, work, you also need SSD because uh, some applications really need um, the local IOPS. The default example is, for, um, for example, the Magento shop software, uh, which has a single-threaded database component. Basically, it does something that is an begin, insert, commit in a for loop. So the second transaction can only start when the first one has terminated. It would be easy to fix that, but nobody has yet. And most customers that we host are more comfortable with us giving us money than actually giving these people money to fix it. I don't know why, but as long as we make a living of that, it's fine. Um, <coughs> the next thing that you want is you want to isolate customers from each other, and that means you need quotas also for I.O. operations per second. But that does work only if you have a sufficient uh, granularity, if you have enough I.O. operations per second in total, and that also needs SSD. Um, because otherwise the, the step when you regulate that, or when the automatism regu regulates that, is just too coarse-grained. Um, SSDs are a bit complicated, because if you try to bring the price down, you're looking at consumer-grade equipment, which is fine, because you're replicating that all over the place. But consumer-grade equipment doesn't have um, an even I.O. performance, you have something that has a very good I.O. performance and then there are all these downspikes. 
and you can scale only for the minimum performance that you ever have. So basically you're looking at something that performs at 20,000 IO operations per second and has down spikes down to 400. So you can actually bring this as to, uh, uh, into the system as something that performs at the 400 level, not at the uh, 10,000 or more level. And um, uh, if you are looking at things that actually work, you're looking at the euro per gigabyte, which is uh, like 100 times more than rotating disk. If you want to cache SSD before you write to disk, that is also complicated because once your working set exceeds the cache, you're basically running on bare naked metal. Um, so you have to be very, very careful that you have enough cache or um, you're basically looking at a system that is running nicely on your cache and then suddenly the working set exceeds your cache uh, and that is like, for the customer, it's like offline because it's very, very slow. So, uh, next lesson, caches are not actually a solution unless you're very, very careful in using them. You have to be very, very careful uh, when you're calculating, calculating your performance numbers and they include caches that you make sure that you never hit the other case. Next up, networking. So, um, <clears throat> even that you've now heard what's wrong with the storage topic in, in OpenStack, the good news I have for you is that we can do decent networking in OpenStack with open source components. The bad news is it still produces pain in certain regions of your body where you don't want to feel pain. One of the biggest problems with OpenStack networking is that most companies will start with a very, very small example setup. So they'll go and, and find some old machines they don't need anymore, and they will just connect them and they will install OpenStack on that, and that will make them feel good because they will end up with something that actually starts virtual machines. That, however, is, is by no means a um, good estimate for whatever you would be running in production if you were running OpenStack in a serious way. We have a number of network requirements for huge OpenStack installations. Here is a list of the most important of them. We have a um, certain requirement skill set for the topology. We need weight-free networking, and we definitely don't want oversubscription in our network because as a cloud provider, you, you don't have any idea what's happening next in your cloud. So you may be having a setup that works perfectly, and then some customer registers himself and just starts uploading hundreds of terabytes of information to your cloud, and you don't want your network to be in, in any way impacted negatively by, by just this event. Because if, if you run the cloud, the serious way, then this can happen any time. You can basically just get a new customer with hundreds of, of dozens of terabyte, um, and he will start uploading those right away. So you need to have something that is oversubscription free. You need to have something that doesn't have any single point of failures. That is very important because what you don't want to experience is a scenario in which one component in your network just fails and the whole architecture starts to collapse. The uh, German agency for unemployed people just experienced this a week ago. They, they went offline completely and the official rationale for that was that one network component failed. You don't want to experience that in your cloud installation <laughs> because if any kind of hardware is a single point of failure and that one fails, it will not impact just a single user, but it will basically impact all the users in your installation. And you want to be able to have multi-tenancy setups, which means that standard technologies such as VLANs need to be implemented in a cloud computing setup as well, but you need something that is more flexible than just the ability to log into a switch and start configuring that particular switch's <coughs> firmware, because that doesn't work very well. In a cloud, you will basically not have any specific switches. You will just have switches that are um, not using VLANs at all, because you don't need them. What you still need is you need something that on the software level of things starts separating packets belonging to different customers. And you don't want to run into a scenario where customer A can see any packet that belongs to customer B. Last but not least, after the explanations Christian made, we also know that our physical storage infrastructure needs to be able to handle the traffic caused by our storage. So we are doing storage using normal network installations and using our network topology, and we need to have reserves in our network topology to cope with the traffic caused by our storage. And last but not least, this is a very typical thing that some of your users may just start to do at any point in time inside your cloud. So if you have a customer that is running a dupe inside your cloud for number crunching, that one customer will definitely be generating lots of traffic. And you want to be prepared for that. So you need a solution that tightly integrates with OpenStack on the one side and still is able to deliver the services you need. 
And then there is Open Research, which is um, existing, I guess. Open Research is the standard Open uh, SDN component that is used by OpenStack. So whenever you start doing a basic OpenStack installation, you will get Open Vswitch. Um, this architecture has a number of serious problems, as you can see here. First of all, we have a GRE ball because we have sort of a GRE mesh network. All nodes inside the cluster will basically be using GRE tunnels to talk to any other nodes in the cluster, um, which means that you will have GRE number tunneling um, ex 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 expanding um, mostly into eternity based on how many hosts you have. From experience, we know that if you start having more than 50 nodes, you will have a problem because Open vSwitch just doesn't scale very well over the limit of 50 physical nodes. Even if you start having more than 100 customer networks inside your OpenStack installation, Open vSwitch will start causing problems, mostly based on large latencies, sometimes based on bad throughput, but you will end up debugging network problems you shouldn't be debugging, in fact. You have a choke point, which is the so-called OpenStack network node. Um, all traffic that goes to the outside needs to go through this particular choke point. And obviously, this choke point also is a single point of failure. So in the default OpenStack installation, um, the only thing as an administrator and from, from a network architecture point of view, uh, you will be asking yourself is what the, you know what I mean. By now, OpenStack has become a bit more major. Recent OpenStack releases have at least addressed a small number of the problems caused by this architecture. But by no means we are at any point where using OpenStack with Open vSwitch would be a decent solution to create large cloud computing environments. And that is why Open vSwitch basically needs to go if you want to run OpenStack in a serious way. What we at Sys11 did was um, we started to look out for other solutions. We started to take a close look at solutions such as VMware NSX. And we finally found something that is called Open Contrail. Open Contrail was written by Pedro Marquez and his team. He was responsible for working on OpenFlow at Google, and then um, actually what he decided to do is, well, let's redo this, but in a working way, and actually based on standard components. And um, Open vSwitch, in fact, is um, not able to compete with Open Contrail in a number of aspects. Open Contrail, as you can see here, comes with a number of different components, all taking care of basic functionality inside the cloud computing environment. And this works extraordinarily well. In fact, Open Contrail is an open source project. By now, it's owned by Juniper. It was a separate project before, but Juniper bought Contrail, um, I think, one and a half year ago or something. Um, so by now, the project is officially owned by Juniper. And Juniper has continued to add um, development capabilities and power to the project, so that is fine. Um, in fact, Open Control can use existing hardware infrastructure, just like Open Vsw, which would be able to do as well. Nothing in it is specific to Juniper. Exactly. It runs so on, on regular networking equipment, any networking equipment. Exactly. You don't need to buy any particular switches by Juniper or something. You can just go with the standard network infrastructure you have. It scales because it uses um, standard protocols such as MPLS and BGP, other well-understood protocols add in. Um, in fact, if you have a virtual machine running inside an OpenStack cloud using Open Contrail, the particular hardware node that is running that virtual machine will start to send out BGP announcement announcements for the official IP address of a virtual machine. So every hypervisor turns into a network node for all virtual machines running on that one node, which means that if anything related to network goes boom on that client, you will only have the VMs on that client affected by the problem and not all virtual machines inside your cloud. <coughs> so there is no central network node anymore. Every hypervisor is a network node on its own. And this works remarkably well if you manage to get the thing up and running. In fact, Open Contrail delivers stuff, and that is a big difference to Open vSwitch. Bad things about Open Contrail, um, and, and this is coming right from our experience that we have collected over the last few years. Um, first, Juniper bought Contrail, and it was obvious that for a long time they had no idea what they would be doing with the company they just bought. So obviously somebody in the Juniper executive department just said, hey, we need something for SDN, go buy, and then they just did that and came back with Open Contrail. And this only has started to become better in recent months. So we are by now seeing some sort of commercial interest by Juniper and Contrail. 
they have started to establish a certain number of processes you would expect to be there, but we are still far away anywhere from, from what you would call a working project. We have a badly outdated documentation, we have a very, very bad release management, and we have a very, 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 very bad packaging when it comes to open control. So um, one example that I just want to give you, when I started working for Sizzlelem, during no point in the interview process, I was asked if I was able to work on Ubuntu systems. So I've been a Debian developer for 14 years now. Um, so when I joined Sys11, the first thing I started doing immediately was redoing the open contrail packages for Ubuntu. I found out some interesting parts about the development process of open contrail. One of them is that if you want to build the open contrail controller, that will be based on scons. Who of you has worked with scons before? Whoa, that's four people. Impressive. Who liked it? <laughs> I could have told you before. So um, the build process is scans based and what Open Control and the controller part will do is during its own build process it will download bind and certain other tools such as curl and certain binaries and patch them locally in the binds in, in the compile folder and build them and generate binaries and libraries and put all those into a shiny package that you then are expected to install on the Ubuntu machine. Obviously, these packages will conflict with a number of integral system packages on Ubuntu. So you will not be able to install them if you use them the way expected you are expected to do by Juniper. And um, dissolving all these things and separating the components that need to be separated actually took 14 days, so that, that was a job 14 days straight. The really bad thing about Open Control, however, is the technology Jenga that they are playing inside the project. So what technologies are you dealing with when working with Open Control? You have the Rerouter kernel module, you use ifmap with Sundash, which is XML over Thrift. Which makes no sense at all. <laughs> you have C++, you have Python, you have Node.js, Albeit you need to remember that you only may use exactly the one Node.js version that Contrail tells you to use because any more recent version is not going to work. You have RD, which is Java. You have Redis, Cassandra, and Zookeeper. You have XMPP, BGP, and MPLS as protocols. Up next in Contrail 2.2, they will be starting Kafka, which I have no idea why the hell they are doing that, but they are. And the interesting part is have you ever written a job profile for, for this skill set and have you gotten any? Um, actual replies to that from, from people not named Pedro Marquez, I guess you haven't. And that was exactly the problem that we were facing with Open Control. So by now we are actually working with Open Control and we were able to bring it into a state where it does what we expect it to do, but that was hard work and we learned that the problem is in fact not only limited to Contrail scope, because you will be dealing with a lot of additional technology when using Open, Contra open, open Stack and Open Control, and that is the next part of the problem. <coughs> So let's let's look at all of OpenStack at the at the whole package that you get. What's what's in it? Um, <coughs> what would be the requirements of something uh, that is distributed something and that uh, happens in 2015? You of course need all the basics. You need uh, time. You need centralized logging, monitoring. You need a functional validation. Uh, what needs to be Functional before something joins a cluster, you need the concept of cluster membership, uh, some kind of, of component that actually does service discovery. Uh, you need the cluster comp uh, communications to be Kai Kingsbury proof, uh, which means that, that there is some kind of consensus protocol that, uh, and, and order guarantees and message loss guarantees that the whole cluster needs to make. Uh, you need the um, communications in the cluster to be uh, authenticated and encrypted. Uh, so you need a CA, you need uh, SSL somewhere, optionally you need uh, also encryption for data at rest. Uh, and you need a user story regarding an upgrade process that is non-interrupting, so that you can do some things to the underlay without the overlay noticing overly much. So that is what OpenStack delivers. None of these things are there, none at all. So it is, it is really a Python script with ambitions, but it's not a cluster at all. Um, and that means you have to do that yourself, and that hurts a lot. You need a lot of medication. Uh, because all of that is not really an isolated problem. There is uh, the heat language, for example, um, that allows you to work with, with infrastructure as code. And if you do that, and um, well, you define a 
medium to large sized e-commerce projects, a few networks, a few VMs, and all in all, that's about 20 VMs. And you start that, then your cluster suddenly turns off. That is because components in the cluster do not really compo uh, communicate with each other, but there is an overload and a hard timeout, and if something takes some time to process that and runs in a timeout, then there is just silence. And that's it. And the question we've been asking then is, are we stupid or is OpenStack stupid? What do other people do? Uh, so there are people who are supposedly running OpenStack in production for money in Germany. You can buy access there and then you take your heat script that fails to their cluster and start that. And the next thing is um, that the phone starts ringing. We don't know what you're doing, but could you please stop doing that? <laughs> Which means we are not stupid. <laughs> this, is, this happened during an upgrade. We, we upgraded um, using the standard Puppet recipes uh, from Icehouse to Juno, from run, run one release to the next, and that actually never terminated. Why is that? Because it asks for all the tenants, users, and roles in the cluster, and then does a loop over that, so you have n times m times, and so on. And it's for every iteration, it's downloading all the information uncached, and it's not actually fast. That is a nice thing, and it works if it's one times one times one. It doesn't terminate ever already for five times five times five. So obviously, this has been tested on a dev stack in Vagrant, on a MacBook Air in St. Oberholz while drinking cappuccino, but not in production. <laughs> Supposedly, I have no idea. But this is how it, how, how it feels like. Um, we did some performance testing on various components. <laughs> Keystone is the authentication component. You need to get a Keystone token to do anything else. And if you set up Keystone uh, like uh, described in the manual with the memcache in front of the keystone and everything, then you get five tokens per second. If you turn off the memcache, you get 250 tokens per second. But the MySQL in the background is running at 11,000 queries per second. Why is it doing that? You look at the statements and actually the ninth statement in the top list is actually doing something useful. The others are just empty transactions and weird statements. And if you look into this, you see that they are not talking to MySQL directly. They're using a Python component called SQL Alchemy, which is a database abstraction. And then they have written a database abstraction that uses SQL Alchemy, because more layers are obviously better. In, in the MySQL protocol, there is something called a ping method that keeps the connection alive. And in the manual, it says, don't use that. It's not recommended. and It's actually not necessary at all. And because they do not trust that ping method in their own abstraction, they have written their own ping method, which is actually begin, select, one commit. Three statements, one transaction. And they're doing that before every other statement. So when you're talking to Keystone, you see begin, select, one commit, begin, something useful, commit. <laughs> and that is why you need a double face palm, <laughs> because one is not enough. Um, somebody in, in the office was, was uh, asking me, could you please look at this? My instances won't. Um, <clears throat> and uh, after a longer debug session, we find that the, on, on some cluster node, for some reason, the puppet failed and the, the uh, libvirt wasn't actually functioning. So the, the um, VMs aren't ever started. But there is no functional validation at all in the cluster before components doesn't join the cluster because it isn't the cluster. It is just enough that something comes up and consumes messages from the AMQP, and then they just vanish, and the, the error code is actually sent back and then ignored. Unless you turn on debugging and then grab through 150 megabytes of debug log, and something some, somewhere in these 150 megabytes, you will find 50 meters of Python stack trace which you're supposed to interpret. <coughs> we are a hoster. We are actually supposed to bill our customers. There is a billing component. It's called Silometer. That is what it looks like. <coughs> uh, this, this is supposed to work with MySQL, only that it doesn't. You have to run MongoDB, which you shouldn't. <laughs> at, at least not if you ever want to write a bill that actually contains valid numbers. <coughs> 
MongoDB is a database for people who don't need a database. Um, but even with MongoDB, it falls over as soon as you have a cluster with some dozen alpha customers and 10 nodes. Uh, so it doesn't scale at all. I don't know, well, I do know how Rackspace builds. They use something else. Uh, and that is part for another later story in this talk. Uh, but they, the entire project seems to be really at war with SQL databases. Also, if you look at the Nova schema, Nova is the actual compute component. Um, the Nova schema is completely branded. It keeps all data twice, active, passive. And every, every query then has to contain about 15 meters of extra wear conditions that uh, cut all the data that is not relevant because it's old and outdated uh, out of the query. But the database then grows out of bounds. You have a constant number of VMs in the cluster, but because you are accumulating more and more history, it becomes slower and slower. Um, so this is obviously not designed or tested for scale. The integration is quite bad and everything feels quite incomplete. Um, yeah, during the release cycle, Horizon got patched uh, to be less confusing for users. Um, the result is that certain functionality that um, actual working networking uh, needs isn't available any longer. Uh, so if you're using open control, it doesn't work. And um, yeah, um, it does work if you do a standard setup but as soon as you try to make it work in a scaling way, parts fall off. It's a bit like, like Lego uh, with respect to that. So the question is, what is the real problem here that the project has? The real problem is that any VM anywhere is a problem definition, but it's not the product specification at all. It's not a user story. A user story would look like this. I am a mm -hmm, and I want to be able to do that and that in order to do that and that. Uh, and then you get requirements, you get a lot of requirements, for example, if you are a hoster. And um, uh, most of these requirements are actually not only related to the product that you want to build, but they are so-called enterprise horizontal requirements that you have because you are in the environment and that come with the environment. You need to isolate tenants, you need uh, a billing model, you need an operations model, how do my sysadmins actually run the cluster. You need a development model or a deployment model on that, and you, of course, need to, to scale. So what you have is a very nice proof of concept. A bunch of geeks wrote something that shows that you can actually build a virtual infrastructure cluster with a scripting language that can bring all of these things up. But it's not really a product. It's a, a, a box with nuts and bolts, not all of them actually bad, but you still have to build the cluster. Um, and it gets worse if you are leaving the infrastructure as a service aspect and go up to the uh, platform or the, the um, uh, SaaS software as a service aspect. If you look at Trove or Sahara or the more up stack projects in OpenStack, um, you need a lot more face palms than just two. So if you are looking at the, product, uh, at the project as a project manager and you see that you have stability on conceptual and integration problems and stack proliferation because there are more and more components, what are you going to do? Are you going to um, stabilize the core with actual engineering? Uh, are you going to fan out more components, more diversity? Let's look at Kilo and what Kilo release will bring us. The good news about the problems Christian has just described is that OpenStack is fully aware of this and that OpenStack is very aware of the problem that a project which has a constantly growing number of products that are part of it is going to be very hard to administrate over the time. So what OpenStack did for the Kilo release is <coughs> they introduced a um, policy that is basically called the Big Tent Initiative, which means that um, previously you could only be an OpenStack core component, so you could only officially be part of OpenStack if you went through the incubation. So some people would gather, they would produce code, they would bring the idea of integrating this into OpenStack up, then the product would be maintained, it would be sort of semi-officially be part of OpenStack, and then after some release periods, it would just become an OpenStack core component. 
that's the um, part for basically all OpenStack core components we see right now. And with Kilo, that is just going to change, because what will happen in Kilo is that we will have a big tent, which means the OpenStack umbrella, the brand name OpenStack, will basically adopt any sort of component that wants to be part of OpenStack and will say, OK, so you're part of OpenStack, now congratulations, which obviously means that the brand will become less important all the time, there will be no constant quality um, assurance over the individual OpenStack components. Um, there will be certain hinds for users telling them what the maturity state of a software actually is. There will be the so-called release tags, and there will be a, a tag that's called core release components or every six months release components. And that will um, supposedly, at least that is the idea behind the solution, tell users these are the core, core components of OpenStack and they are officially maintained. The problem is that all big vendors doing OpenStack right now are just rubbing their hands and actually what they want to do now, obviously, is put all their, uh, all their material, all their software into OpenStack, which basically will end up with a problem um, that is the Big Ten is full of clowns, right? Um, if, if it's a Big Ten, actually, you will have a number of people in there. There will be developers, there will be numerous pieces of software. You will most likely have software components doing basically the same thing. So you will have multiple solutions for the same problems. And uh, as, as a colleague of ours just stated quite in a correct way, instead of having one functional solution, I can now choose between 13 that are completely broken. In different ways. Mine is really a sunshine. <laughs> And that is one of the biggest problems that the Big Tent initiative actually is going to bring into OpenStack. So at least in our opinion, the Big Tent thing is not going to make OpenStack better or more stable. It's just going to add more diversity into a project that really doesn't need any additional diversity because by now it already is complex enough um, to properly work. The interesting part here is um, how, how well does democracy as a software architecture model actually work, especially if democracy is not so much the, the case in this project because there is a lot of money in it and lots of vendors willing to, to throw even more money in. In fact, if you have a product definition, you also have a target specification. So what you will have is you will have a very clear definition of where do I need to go with my code? What sort of functionality do I have to implement in order to make this product actually useful? And um, in fact, you need some sort of overarch uh, overarching product definition. So you would need something that tells people OpenStack is expected to be this and to do that. And right now, that is exactly the part that is missing. The interesting question is, who is our customer and what do they need? And based from that definition, it would be relatively easy to go ahead and tell people what are the mandatory, desirable, optional properties of the product? What do we want in this thing? What sort of functionality do we need? And what is part of our problem space? And what is something that we may not even want to address? Why can't we just say there is a solution for this already? Use this and let us not reinvent something else, which OpenStack has done a number of times. And once you are at that point, so once you are at the point where you have a clear target definition of what you want to achieve, obviously you can start doing certain things such as quality assurance. So you wouldn't be running into the problems that Christian and I have just described. You wouldn't be running into a problem where the dashboard, the OpenStack Horizon dashboard, suddenly becomes unusable because some developer removed lines of code without really understanding that he was making implications on our software as well. And now obviously, um, if you've worked with OpenStack, then you will say, hey, wait, there's quality assurance, right? So I was bugged by OpenStack developers because I didn't specify proper unit tests for the OpenStack code that I submitted. Um, the problem is, without a target specification, you have no idea about the requirements, so you have no idea where to go. You can certainly unit test your code, and you can make sure that it fulfills certain requirements if you have those requirements. If you don't have the requirements, you will get 100% certified bullshit. And that's the case in OpenStack most of the time. So you will have bullshit you know that works, but you have no idea what it will actually do. And well, these are the companies supporting you in doing that. All these individual vendors have very own interests when it comes to OpenStack. And obviously, they have a very moderate interest in their own OpenStack product. They don't want the OpenStack project 
per se to be successful. What they want is their product to be successful. And the funny thing is, for Red Hat or any other OpenStack vendor, it doesn't really make sense to keep OpenStack in its natural form up and working, because if that was the case, their product would be very hard to make unique. If the OpenStack upstream distribution was just working fine with all the material that you need, for the vendors it would be very hard to generate a known product on top of that. So as funny as it sounds, but as Rackspace or HP or Red Hat or whoever you are, you don't want OpenStack Hat to be really working because that would actually um, make your own business model uh, very hard to implement. So. Um, in addition to that, obviously, we would need a limited learnable technology stack when working with OpenStack because in its current form, for starters, um, it's, it's completely impossible to just start working on OpenStack. If you're not a very experienced Python programmer, you will not be able to work with OpenStack in its current way as a developer. Also, companies will not be able to hire people just working on OpenStack the way it currently is. For system administrators, it's almost impossible to understand what's happening in the background if you're not some sort of experienced developer. And it gets even worse because we have additional components being added to that. Um, yeah, so I guess you start with yeah. this one. This is just an example. This is one of the service components. This is monitoring as a service. It's called Monasca. And if you go to the wiki and ask what does it do, they will tell you it's an open source. Multi-tenant, highly scalable, performant, falter do I have a bingo already? Yeah. Uh, monitoring as a service solution that integrates with OpenStack. It uses a REST API for um, high-speed metrics processing, uh, a querying, and it has a streaming engine and a notification engine. Yes. So, so what is it made from except from 100% free-range organic small batch passwords? It's made from Kafka, Storm, Zookeeper, MySQL, Vagrant, Drop Wizard. Vertica and Influx to be. I think this is still missing MongoDB, but yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Try to run that. It's fun. Um, people really try to to do things in OpenStack because they can and and push things in this. Or they try to unify concepts that that uh, are really hard to unify. We we have this this uh, container-based Docker stuff, for example, and Docker is a lot like OpenStack, only it's from a dev perspective, whereas OpenStack is more from an ops perspective. So wouldn't it be great if we if we unify that? If you do that, you will see there is a component. There is a, is a Nova Compute Docker, for example. Um, but if you try to run that, you see that it is possible to start a Docker container, <coughs> but the concept of an image in Docker and the concept of an image in OpenStack, um, they can't really be unified. That leads to an image explosion. Uh, what Lance does in OpenStack and what the image registry does in Docker, they are different things. And it is not enough to write the Nova component to start Docker images in your cloud. You also have to change a lot of other things. That is not happening at all in a controlled way. There is the LXC, there's the LXD, there's the Docker project and OpenStack, and they all just concentrate on the compute component, but they're not thinking about how OpenStack as a virtualization concept needs to change in order to accommodate these ideas, and what would be a good strategy to do that. So, which brings us to the really important question, where is OpenStack now and how is the OpenStack project um, aiming at fixing the problems that we have just explained? Um, as you will certainly know, there is a semi-annual OpenStack Developer Summit twice a year. So, all people interested in OpenStack gather together and start working and start discussing problems, or at least that is what you think they would do. And as we just explained, there is a number of problems to be addressed in OpenStack. Now, if you go to Flickr and just enter OpenStack into the search box, this is what you get. Um, so, there may be room for improvement in that certain aspect, right? And um, we're obviously not the only people having that impression because Florian Haas from Estexo um, has just published a, a public post about the uh, um, 2014 OpenStack Summit uh, in which he complained about exactly this thing, being 
OpenStack developer summits are by now completely overrun by large companies, and, and what really is the most important part is the partying, and not so much doing technical discussions, and defining the targets that you want to achieve with your software. So that is something that definitely needs improvement, and that is something that we really expect and hope to see in OpenStack soon. So, um, who, who has uh, fallen asleep during the presentation? <laughs> who is still asleep and can't answer? <laughs> I guess for those of you who just want a quick and, 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 and fast summary of what we've been telling you over the last few uh, minutes here, and just to understand and just to point out that we are by no means um, hostile against OpenStack. We, we like OpenStack. Actually, we've invested a lot of work into OpenStack, and, and by now we have a solution that is able to sort of live up to our expectations. We know there is still a lot of work to do, um, but what we do not want to do today is uh, let you go with the statement OpenStack is a pile of, a pile of shit that nobody needs to use, because that is not the case. What we want to tell you is OpenStack is not a ready product. No matter what vendors tell you, if you want to go with OpenStack, you do not get a solution that will fit your needs. You will have to invest a lot of time, and OpenStack more is a box of nuts and bolts, and you need to screw them together in a way to be perfect, to fit for your enterprise. That is a large portion of work. And that is something that you need to take into consideration if you consider going with OpenStack. No other OpenStack, no other project in the cloud community right now has the OpenStack momentum. So it's not like there's an alternative. There is Eucalyptus and there is Open Nebula and whatnot. But really, if you want to go large scale on a web hosting platform, then OpenStack is the project you want to go with for large enterprises. That's the way it is. So you don't get around it, but you need to invest time to make it work. Many other projects suffer from limitations, such as not having multi-tenancy mode, um, or multi-node functionality, that is something you all get in OpenStack. You just need to make it fit, and you just need to stick it together in a way that works for you. Um, yeah, that's your part. Yeah. Thanks. OpenStack is that way, the way it is, because it's currently approximately here in the standard hype cycle. Um, so the next thing that happens is that, and uh, I hope we have been part of that. Um, what needs to happen is some kind of consolidation, not just in the market, but also in the technology. Some kind of, of unified view on what we actually want to build and how we are going to build this, so that we get a manageable piece of something that actually does that. Um, vendors are currently not helpful. S vendors are building distributions of OpenStack. They all promise you the, the uh, uh, Viennese uh, castle that you have seen in the beginning. Uh, but no vendor actually has a solution that is complete. That is because SDN and SDS, software defined storage, software defined networking, are two very hard problems and they have very little overhead. And you can get things from one vendor that is probably having an SDS solution or other people like Juniper that have an SDN solution. But you can't get a distro that is up to date and is actually solving both problems in an acceptable way. So you need Vendors need to agree and they need to start to actually cooperate instead of trying to uh, win the market and own it in some kind of way. That is not going to happen, but they still don't believe that. That is also normal for that part of market or product maturity. Uh, but um, they need to come through that and actually reach this. That is going to happen. It's starting right now, but it is not there yet in any way. Um, yeah, and um, you also have to remember that uh, OpenStack is not an Apache project, but in some ways it's like an Apache project. And Apache is also a development model that is something that vendors use to manage open source. That means to be open sourcey without being actually open sourcey, because if you want something that actually works, you have to still buy the proprietary things or add proprietary components to make it work. That is nothing new. The same thing happens in the Hadoop market. And the, the entire model was prototyped, basically, uh, with the uh, Java community process. So, yeah, if you have questions, please ask them. If you don't have questions and you want to know more about OpenStack, come to this. It's just around the corner at Urania in June. And thanks. They always need somebody to be the first. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Okay, then. <laughs> See, thank ah. you so much. Ah. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, what are alternatives to OpenStack? Um, there is many components that are not really uh, multi-tenancy, and I think that um, OpenNebula, for example, is such a thing that is similar um, in the way that it um, lives with libvirt and KVM and stuff. Uh, but for example, it doesn't do SDN, and I don't know how well it does SDS. Uh, there are container solutions. Many of them ignore, uh, for example, storage requirements for mobile storage for for SDS. That means that once you start a container somewhere, it's tied to there. And once you have one kind of container on a box, you have co-scheduling requirements that also require that you have other types of containers on the same box. Um, that is something that in an infrastructure as code thing you would want to avoid. And if you want network tenant isolation, things get even more complicated. There is CloudStack that kind of does a similar thing. There was Eucalyptus, uh, a company uh, headed by, by Morten Mikas, which, uh, who was previously the CEO of MySQL, which is how I knew him. But uh, his company got bought by HP, and uh, Eucalyptus is now part of the HP cloud thingy which basically means it's dead because HP does OpenStack. Um, hmm? Because it's HP. Because it's HP, yes. But <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that's mostly what is in the market. More questions? All right, so we'll be around um, for the rest of the afternoon. Um, so if you have any questions you would have after you leave the room here, then please feel free to ask, and uh, we wish you a pleasant rest of the day in Berlin. Thank you.